You always hear talk about how evil the central banks are and how Bitcoin can replace them and usher in a new digital golden age. But do you know the history of the central banks here in the United States? It's story time. Let's get it. Welcome to Bitboy Crypto, the hardest working channel in all of cryptocurrency. If you're new, hit that subscribe button. Check the description for links you can use to connect with me and the Bit Squad. All right, guys, today we're going to be hopping in a time machine to go back in history and learn some things. Old Bitboy is going to give you guys an education on central banks. Four score and seven years ago. I'm just kidding. I'm no honest aid. Many of you may be shocked to learn that the U.S. Federal Reserve is not the first central bank in the U.S., in fact, the Bank of the United States, proposed by Alexander Hamilton, was established in 1791. They didn't teach you that in the musical. My name is Alexander Hamilton. It served as a repository for federal funds and as the government's fiscal agent at that time. However, critics of the first bank believed its fiscal caution was constraining economic development. Its charter was not renewed until 1811. The second bank was formed five years later, bringing renewed controversy despite the U.S. Supreme Court support of its power at the time. President Andrew Jackson removed all federal funds from the bank after his re-election in 1832, and it ceased operations as a national institution after its charter expired in 1836. Initially proposed by Alexander Hamilton, the first bank was granted a 20-year charter by Congress in spite of opposition that it represented an unconstitutional use of federal power. The bank, which was based in Philadelphia with branches in eight cities, conducted general commercial business and acted for the government. Critics working with agrarian opponents of the bank succeeded in preventing renewal of the charter in 1811, and the first bank went out of operation. However, problems associated with the financing of the War of 1812 led to a revival of a U.S. central bank. And in 1816, the second bank of the United States was established, with functions similar to the first. Still, those pesky early Bitcoiners that didn't know they were Bitcoiners. State-owned banks and Western entrepreneurs continued to criticize the U.S. central bank's existence. It's almost like they could see the issues caused by central banking right from the start. All right, so back to the story. Where was I? Ah, yes. In 1833, Andrew Jackson, as president, removed all federal funds from the bank. When his charter expired in 1836, the second bank ended its operations as a national institution. It was reestablished as a commercial bank under the laws of Pennsylvania, where it continued to operate until its eventual failure in 1841. Now, pay attention. This part is important. Around the same time in 1834, the United States fixed the price of gold at $20.67 per ounce, where it remained until 1933. However, the U.S. wasn't on the gold standard for its currency until 1879. After the closing of the second bank, financial turmoil resulted between the periods of 1836 and the founding of the Federal Reserve System in 1913, specifically in 1907 and 1908. But we're getting ahead of ourselves. The U.S. was without a central bank until 1913. You see, back in 1910, a bunch of bankers met on Jekyll Island off the coast of Georgia and deviously plotted the resurgence of a U.S. central bank named the Federal Reserve. Six men, Nelson Aldrich, A. Piot Henry, Henry Davison, Arthur Shelton, Frank Vanderflip, and Paul Warburg met at Jekyll Island to write a plan to reform the nation's banking system. The meeting and its purpose were closely guarded secrets, and participants did not admit that the meeting occurred until the 1930s. The plan written on Jekyll Island laid the foundation for what would eventually become the Federal Reserve System that we all love, I mean hate, today. Prior to Christmas, when the majority of congressmen and the American people were sleeping and relaxing near their stonkings tied by the fire with joy, the Federal Reserve Act passed and then was signed by President Woodrow Wilson. The House passed the bill 29860 on the evening of December 22nd, 1913. The Senate began debating the following day at 10 a.m., and it passed 43 to 25 at 2.30 p.m. However, there were missing senators because they were at home with families celebrating Christmas. Since there were 48 states in 1913, 48 votes plus the tie-breaking vote of Vice President Thomas Marshall would have been sufficient to approve the bill, even if all absent votes had been cast against the bill. Although, it's important to note that many of the missing senators had their decisions recorded in the congressional record later. Of the 27 votes not cast, there were 11 in favor of the bill and 12 against it. 
even if the absentee senators had been there, the currency bill would still have passed. President Wilson signed the currency bill, a.k.a. Federal Reserve Act, into law in a public ceremony on December 23, 1913. Wilson would later regret his actions and before his death stated, I am a most unhappy man. Unwittingly, I've ruined my country. It did not take long for the Federal Reserve to begin profoundly changing the nature of money. In just its first seven years of operation, wholesale prices in the United States rose more than 240%. Not surprisingly, between 1914 and 1920, the currency in circulation had increased 242%. The Fed was already undermining the gold standard before it even ended. A few years later, the U.S. suffered from the Great Depression, the worst economic downturn in history of the industrialized world, lasting from 1929 to 1939 maybe up until now. It began, though, after the stock market crash of October 1929, which sent Wall Street into a panic and wiped out millions of investors. What caused the Great Depression is debated and speculated with varying reasons, and we won't get into that today as we don't really have the time. What happened, though, during the Great Depression in 1933 would change the U.S. dollar forever. On June 5, 1933, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt signed a bill ending the gold standard, which was a monetary system where U.S. currency was backed by gold. Then, Congress enacted a joint resolution nullifying the right of creditors to demand payment in gold. But bank failures during the Great Depression of the 1930s frightened the public into hoarding gold. Roosevelt also ordered all gold coins and gold certificates and denominations of more than $100 confiscated and turned in for U.S. dollars. It required all persons to deliver all gold coins, gold bullion, and gold certificates owned by them to the Federal Reserve by May 1st for the set price of $20.67 per ounce. By May 10th, the government had taken in $300 million of gold coins and 470 million gold certificates. In 1934, the government price of gold was increased to $35 per ounce, effectively increasing the gold on the Federal Reserve's balance sheets by 69%, your favorite number. This increase in assets allowed the Federal Reserve to inflate the money supply further. The government held the $35 per ounce price until August 15, 1971, when President Richard Nixon announced that the United States would no longer convert dollars to gold at a fixed value, thus completely abandoning the gold standard. Accordingly, I have directed the Secretary of the Treasury to take the action necessary to defend the dollar against the speculators. In fact, gold became illegal to own for three years, until in 1974, President Gerald Ford signed legislation that permitted Americans again to own gold. There's one more key thing to note, and this is going to go down to spark some conspiracy. It's widely accepted by now that JFK's murder was a sophisticated assassination plot with the release of sealed files a few years ago. But JFK actually sought to take power away from the Federal Reserve and give it back to the U.S. Treasury with Executive Order 11110. Some speculate this is what got him killed. And again, it's pure speculation, but crypto, we love speculation. The missing link to this, however, is going to spark even more theories. On March 19, 1968, President Lyndon B. Johnson, who took over after JFK was killed, signed a bill eliminating the gold backing for Federal Reserve notes. Prior to the removal of the gold cover, each Federal Reserve bank had been required to hold a gold certificate reserve of not less than 25% against its Federal Reserve note liability. Now you know the history of the U.S. central banks and the shift away from the gold standard, which is a good place to start. In future videos, we're going to discuss U.S. fiscal policy, inflation, and why things have gone so far down the drain with quantitative easing and bailouts. We are literally in a pressure cooker ready to explode, and I hope you're ready because we could see an economic collapse in the not-too-distant future. I'm in the pressure cooker. So where are things heading next? It seems like digital central bank currencies are next in the very near future. A consortium of banks tested digital cash in 2016 in a Wall Street test run, which didn't get much fanfare. If the American people ever allow private banks to control the issue of their currency, first by inflation, then by deflation, the banks and corporations that will grow up around the banks will deprive the people of all property till their children wake up homeless on the continent their fathers conquered. The issuing power should be taken from the banks and restored to the people to whom it properly belongs. That is from Thomas Jefferson, who everybody loved until they all hated him this year. Then from Woodrow Wilson. I'm a most unhappy man. I've unwittingly ruined my country. 
A great industrial nation is controlled by its system of credit. Our system of credit is concentrated. The growth of the nation, therefore, and all our activities are in the hands of a few men. We've come to be one of the worst ruled, one of the most completely controlled and dominated governments in the civilized world. No longer a government by free opinion. No longer a government by conviction and the vote of the majority. But a government by the opinion and duress of a small group of dominant men. All of those words would be proven to be true. But now it's your turn. Did you find the history of central banking in the U.S. interesting? Would you like to see more videos covering history and how macroeconomics impacts Bitcoin? Let me know what you think down below in the comments section. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please make sure to smash the like button and hit subscribe to become a member of the BitSquad. Thank you so much for watching. Have a blessed day. BitBoy out.